Hello, and welcome back to another tutorial video. I hope you have all adjusted to the new schedule. This past week, we have begun to discuss regression or Gaussian response models in this course. In today's tutorial, I want to dive into discussing regression models with you and show you how incredibly useful they can be. In today's tutorial, I generally want you to get comfortable thinking about what regression models are, how we can interpret them, how they can be used, and some pitfalls we might want to look out for. Along the way, I hope that you become more comfortable fitting the models, thinking about them, and using them to test hypotheses. Now, this video will dive into topics that you may not have gotten to in the reading so far. Do not worry too much about that. You can use this as an introduction to the utility of regression and come back to the problems we look at afterwards to ground yourself more. It's my hope that these examples begin to show you how useful what we have been learning in this course is and give you a solid base for applying these techniques in the future. To begin, let's try to discuss the question, what is linear regression? The idea at its most basic is quite simple. Suppose that we have a random variable, call it y, that we care about. We have seen in this course so far that if we assume a distribution for y, we can use estimation techniques to estimate parameters related to the distribution of the random variable. Often we will make the assumption, for instance, that y is Gaussian and use maximum likelihood estimation to determine its mean parameter. Now, in the real world, often we are concerned not with one quantity by itself, but rather how one quantity is impacted by another. We might want to know how the amount of rainfall in a region impacts crop growth, or how the size of a house impacts its sale price, or the relationship between the number of hours that you study and your grade in STAT 231. In each of these scenarios, we have a variable which is an outcome of sorts, crop growth, house prices, or grades, and an independent variable, which we think may be related to the outcome. In these settings, we are not as interested in estimating the parameters of the model of the outcome variable directly, but rather in estimating some type of relationship between these traits. Linear regression is one possible mechanism for doing this. In order to do this, instead of assuming that y is Gaussian with a constant mean and variance, we instead assume that given the observations for the independent factor, our outcome is Gaussian with mean given by alpha plus beta times the independent factor, call it x. We still typically assume constant variance. What we are saying with this assumption practically is that there is a linear relationship between our dependent and independent variable on average. That is, if we experience an increase of one for our independent factor, we would expect to observe an increase of beta for our dependent factor. Now, with this assumption, we can use our standard estimation technique, maximum likelihood estimation, to form estimates of the parameters alpha and beta, and as a result, produce an estimated regression line. This line forms our best guess to the linear relationship, describing the outcome as a function of the factor. Turns out that if instead of using maximum likelihood estimation and assuming Gaussian model, you instead try to find the best estimates by minimizing the so-called squared error, you wind up with exactly the same equation. This is why you will sometimes see regression models being referred to as least squares estimation or ordinary least squares. A key distinction between the Gaussian assumption with maximum likelihood estimation is that this process allows us to make statements regarding the distribution of our estimators, alpha and beta, and as a result, we can use all of the tools that we have been investigating, so confidence intervals, hypothesis tests, sampling distributions, and so on, to investigate our estimators. If we are not able or willing to make the Gaussian assumption, we should still expect that the estimates for alpha and beta will be good estimates since they minimize the squared error, but we cannot make claims regarding their distributions. Now, there are two things that I'd like to note about this setup of regression models before moving on. First, what we have presented here is referred to as simple linear regression, where simple refers to the fact that we have exactly one explanatory factor. However, the same basic process will extend to as many explanatory variables as we would like. These more complicated regression models, typically referred to as multiple linear regression, expand by allowing the mean of y to be given by the relationship between many factors, say for example alpha plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2, and so on. These models are brought up theoretically throughout the chapter and are investigated in detail in section 6.4. What's important to note is that conceptually multiple linear regression and simple linear regression function similarly. We have to be a little bit careful in our interpretation, but for the most part, a deep understanding of one will give an understanding of the other. Second, when we call these models linear, the linearity refers to the parameters, not the independent variables. So for instance, 
if we think that instead of being related to x, the mean of y is really related to x squared, we can instead pose the simple linear regression model given by alpha plus beta times x squared. This is still a linear regression model since it is linear in the parameters. This is sometimes confusing, but it's important to remember that linearity refers to our betas, not our x's. Now, with these two points in mind, and with the acknowledgement that even when the outcomes are not linear, the estimates can still be thought of as good, in a sense, you may begin to get a feel for how powerful linear regression can be. We can use it to model incredibly complex relationships between any number of variates, and it is a technique that is used pervasively throughout statistics and data science. What I want to do next is to walk through some real-world examples of using linear regression to great effect. I will begin with a fairly simple example, predicting the relationship between an individual's weight and their height, which will help to solidify some of these concepts. I'll spend some time walking through the fit, the model diagnostics, the types of hypotheses that we may test, and indicating the differences between prediction intervals and confidence intervals. Once we have seen this example, we will take a look at additional regression models performing a number of tasks, investigating the relationship between real estate prices and factors, predicting the rated quality of a red wine based on its chemical factors, or trying to determine what makes a song popular on Spotify. To begin, I wanted to take a look at simple linear regression using a fairly simple relationship, height and weight. We know that on average, the taller someone is, the more that they will weigh, but can we say anything more specific about that? We begin by considering some data. This data is taken from individuals who identified as female who are between the ages of 30 and 39 living in America in 1975. As a good rule of thumb, we should start by plotting the data and looking at what we can see. This scatter plot shows us a few things. First, there is a very clear relationship between the height of an individual and their weight. This is good news, seeing as that is the relationship we wish to predict. We can also note from this plot that there do not appear to be very many observations. Indeed, there are only 15. This means that we might need to be careful about what conclusions we make, particularly with respect to the model diagnostics. Data can behave very strangely when there's not much of it. I'd also encourage you all to play around with some other descriptive statistics for these data, and indeed, any time that you have data to look at. All of the data files from today's tutorial are available on the course website. With the scatter plot indicating that modeling this relationship appears to be a well-founded idea, we can begin the process of doing so formally. Let's take some time to write down exactly what it is we are assuming before continuing. Here, we are considering a random variable y, which in this case represents an individual's weight measured in kilograms. In order to perform simple linear regression, we are going to assume that y follows a Gaussian distribution with a constant standard deviation, which we will denote with sigma. Sigma is unknown. y has a mean given by alpha plus beta times x. Here, alpha and beta are unknown parameters, and x represents the individual's height. With this model explicitly defined, we can use the lm command in R and specify the regression model we are interested in. Taking the results of that command and passing it to the summary command in R, we get a lot of information. Most of what we are interested in is contained in this output. Let's begin by investigating what is in here. Note that in the real world, you will want to check model diagnostics before interpretation, and we will cover model diagnostics here in a moment, but I want to begin simple and get situated with what this output tells us. All of the following discussion is only accurate if our model is accurately fitting the data. First, we can take a look at the estimates for the two parameters of key interest. Here we see that alpha is estimated as negative 39.062 and that beta is estimated as 0 0.61272. This gives us an estimated regression line of negative 39.062 plus 0 0.61272 times x, where x is given by the individual's height in centimeters. So what does this beta coefficient mean? Well, let's think about it for a moment. If we increase x by 1 centimeter, then our regression line tells us that we expect y to increase by 0.6, roughly. As a result, the beta parameter represents our estimate for the average increase in weight resulting from a unit increase in height. The summary statement also gives us the result of a test as to whether beta is different from 0. Recall that a value of beta equals 0 would suggest that there is no linear relationship between the weight and the height. The p-value provided in the table is the p-value of a test of the null hypothesis that beta equals zero. We can see that this p-value is on the order of 10 to the negative 14, which for all intents and purposes is zero. 
As a result, we can feel very confident that our beta estimate is different from zero, as we likely expect. From this output as well, we can also see the estimated standard deviation of our original random variable y. This value is tucked away a little bit, but we can read it off as the residual standard error. Recall from the formula in table 6.1 on page 237 that the estimate is given by the square root of the sum of the squared errors divided by n minus two. In this case, we can compute the sum of the squared errors directly to be approximately 7.5, dividing by n minus two, which is 13, and taking the square root gives us 0.7591. Now, looking back at the summary table, we can see that this is exactly the value output as the residual standard error. We could of course consider both confidence and prediction intervals as well. The easiest way to do this is to use the R function conf int, where we can pass the level parameter. Calling this with a 95% confidence level tells us that the lower bound for our estimate on beta is given by 0.574, and the upper bound is 0.651. I implore you to consider the exact interpretation of the confidence interval here and remind you to rewatch the previous tutorials if you're not entirely sure on the meaning. Let's say that we are interested in people who are 155 centimeters tall. There are two relevant intervals we can compute here, either the confidence interval or the prediction interval. Now, these two intervals are related to one another, but it is important not to confuse them. A confidence interval should be thought of as an interval around a mean estimate. In this case, if we wanted to know how much individuals who were 105 centimeters were on average, then a confidence interval will quantify our uncertainty in this estimate. If, on the other hand, we want to estimate the weight of a single individual who happens to be 155 centimeters tall, we would want to use a prediction interval for this. In general, the prediction interval will be wider, particularly for small n, as we have more uncertainty in our estimate of one individual's weight than we do averaged across many individuals. Why is this? Well, for any individual who is 155 centimeters tall, it is possible that they happen to weigh more than average or they weigh less than the average at that height. Our assumption is that people's weights are normally distributed. And so if this assumption is correct, then we would expect that individuals who are 155 centimeters tall will be normally distributed centered at the value the regression line estimates, in this case, 55.91, so if we sample a random individual from this population, we not only have to worry about the variance in our estimated coefficients, we saw a range on those earlier, but we also have to worry about the variance that the individuals have in their weights, as not all individuals who are the same height are the same weight. Keeping in mind that our confidence interval and prediction intervals are for two different quantities, we can get both using the predict function with the respective intervals clarified. The confidence interval goes from 55.337 to 56.483. The prediction interval goes from 54.173 to 57.647. Note that the confidence interval is less wide than the prediction interval. Now, as mentioned previously, all of this discussion depends on the model fit being adequate. In general, there are two assumptions that we need to check. First, we need yi given the desired covariates to be Gaussian with constant standard deviation. Second, we need the expected value of y to be linear in the parameters given the desired covariates. Our main tools for assessing whether these are adequate or not are plots, and in particular, plots of the estimated residuals. The basic idea when considering plots of the residuals is that we should not see any sort of pattern. The point should roughly form a random cloud, and if we see different shapes, that may indicate a problem with the model. In particular, we may see U-shapes or inverted U-shapes, or fanning out of the points or contracting of the points or similar. When we see these in the plots, we should carefully consider what we are doing with the model and if we cannot improve it. We will also bring back QQ plots once more. First, we'll take a look at the plots of the residuals versus the heights of the individuals and the residuals versus the predicted values. If our model is good, we should see that both of these plots appear roughly random. As you can see, they do not. In particular, we see both of these plots exhibit a U-shaped pattern. For good measure, we can also consider the QQ plot, which also does not appear to suggest normality. The QQ plot is slightly difficult to parse here due to the fairly small sample size, but needless to say that in conjunction with the other plots, the fit does not appear great. Now, when we see a U-shaped pattern in the plot of the residuals versus an explanatory variable, 
as we saw in the plot of residuals versus height, this often suggests a missing quadratic term. That is, it suggests that if we were to explain a person's weight using both their height and their height squared, we should see an improved fit. So why don't we try this? A couple of points to note. First, this is still a linear regression, even if we include x squared. Remember, we care if it is linear in the parameters, not in the variables. And so now we are assuming that the mean of y can be expressed as alpha plus beta 1 times x plus beta 2 times x squared, which is still linear. Second, while this is only covered in material that is beyond this week, we can use basically the same code and process to assess it. Here, we fit the model again, and I'll show you the summary output. Note that we still have p-values near zero for the height and for the height squared, which suggests strong evidence against the null that beta one or beta two are equal to zero. Additionally, we could produce confidence intervals and prediction intervals in exactly the same way. However, the interesting part for our analysis is whether the model diagnostics look better. We now consider the plots of residuals versus height, residuals versus height squared, and residuals versus the fitted values, and the QQ plots of those residuals. Looking at these plots, even briefly, suggests a much better fit. There are no clearly discernible patterns, and it seems like our quadratic linear regression model may be a good fit. For good measure, I'll plot the scatter plot once more with the fitted line over top, and we can see that it looks pretty good. I hope this shows you that with the tools you've been developing in this course so far, you are starting to have a wonderful ability to make inroads on real world problems. The question of how one variable relates to another is one which is of common interest and one which you are starting to have a toolbox to answer. I wouldn't fault any of you though, if you thought that the first example I've used was rather boring. Predicting the weight of an individual given their height is not exactly groundbreaking, and that's where these next examples come in. As a way of introducing some more exciting applications, I want to present some more complicated regression models on slightly more exciting topics. I want to use regression models to consider house prices based on a number of their factors, to predict the rated quality of red wine based on a chemical analysis of those wines, and to predict the popularity of a song on Spotify based on its factors. Now, instead of walking through in any detail the process of coming to these models, I want to present the final model that I've come up with. We can look at the diagnostics and some predictions that they make and try to dive deeper. The data files are all available on the class website in case you would like to try and play around a little more or investigate these relationships for yourselves. The first modeling task I want to look at involves predicting the quality of red wine from a number of factors of that wine. To get started, I'm including a plot that shows how strong the correlations between pairs of variables in the data. In this plot, the area and intensity of the color dictate the magnitude of the relationship, where blue represents positive correlations and red represents negative correlations. Looking at the quality factor, we can see that the alcohol and volatile acidity seem to be the most correlated factors, and so we might expect them to be important in the relationship. Now, one thing to note is that we cannot consider the factors in isolation and infer directly what will or won't be important. Consider the fact that volatile acidity factor is highly negatively correlated with the citric acid factor. The relationship between these two variables may very well impact the relationship between quality and them. Still, it's always a good idea to look at your data before trying to do some modeling. There is also one further concern we have with our outcome. In particular, if I call table on the variable, we can see that it is a discrete observation. In this data set, we observe values between three and eight, but theoretically, we could observe values from zero to 10. I want you to try and think about why this might be a problem. For now, we will ignore the discrete nature of the variable and continue to fit our model. After trying out some models myself, I found that a model which uses seven of the 11 possible variables performed suitably well. This was a model that dropped fixed acidity, citric acid, residual sugar, and density. These factors were found to not suitably improve the model performance, and so they were dropped. The summary output is essentially the same as in our simple linear regression. This time, we just have more factors. We can still look and see that the p-values testing whether the coefficients are different from zero are all nearly zero. The highest p-value is for the free sulfur dioxide variable with a value of 0.017. This suggests that everything in the model likely should be here. We can also consider the diagnostic plots, starting with the residual versus fitted. 
Here we see something that is strange but not unexpected. There are these diagonal lines appearing here. Is that concerning? Can you think of why we might be seeing this? What is strange about the outcome that may cause this banding pattern? Notice that we have six different bands here and that there were six different values for the quality that we could have seen. If I add some colors and shapes to this plot, giving each quality level a different one, we see that each of these bands refers to a discrete quality level. This makes sense if we think about it. The possible true values for quality fall on the discrete line and our estimated values, which are plotted along the x-axis, are going to be a fixed amount towards or away from the prediction forming exact lines for each level. In fact, this is always going to be the pattern you see if you treat a discrete variable as continuous and plot the residuals versus the fitted. If instead we grab a variant from the model, say alcohol, and plot residuals versus that variable, we do not see the same banding pattern and things look pretty good. We can also take a look at the QQ plot. Here, we may have some concerns in the lower tail, perhaps it warrants considering some transformations of the data. More likely though, we should reconsider the outcome we have used here. Remember that ultimately, our quality scale values can only take on discrete values, while our predictions are theoretically any real value. Additionally, our maximum value that makes sense is 10, while the minimum value that makes sense is zero. There is nothing stopping our linear model from predicting outside this interval. For instance, consider two wines which are given by the following features. Now, someone who might know more about wine than I do may be able to look at this and suggest that these wines could not possibly exist, which is fair. But if they could exist, then our model would produce the following 95% prediction intervals with given point estimates. We can see that the first wine has a predicted value of quality greater than 10, and the second a value less than zero. Notice that the 95% intervals are computed in exactly the same way, but that they contain many impossible values. So. What's the moral of the story? Well, first, our regression model appears to perform adequately in terms of model diagnostics. It may be worth playing around with some transformations of the outcome or redefining the outcome to overcome some of the concerns regarding the discreteness. Overall, though, that does not appear to be a meaningful drawback to our model. If we are careful about considering the output of the model, then it may be acceptable to use. And assuming that it is acceptable, that's very exciting for me. I can use what I do know about stats to make up for what I do not know about red wine. The next task we are considering is trying to determine the price that a house sells for based on factors like its proximity to stores and public transit and where it's located. Now, the data set that we have lists the outcome as price per unit area, so perhaps price per square foot. This is not the typical way we would think of pricing a home where normally you'd care greatly about the size or number of rooms. These data instead look at, after you've accounted for the size of the house, what will still matter. I wanna do two things here. First, I want to approach the question of, does the longitude of the house matter using regression techniques? Then I will show you the output from a fitted model, and I'd love to spend some time interpreting the coefficients we have estimated. To answer the question, does the longitude matter, we need to be very careful in how we interpret this question specifically. In particular, we need to be able to translate this to a statement about statistical parameters. Generally, when we are asking about whether a factor matters, we are specifically asking whether that factor differs from zero. In this case, it may not be entirely clear what factor we are even talking about. We could start by fitting a simple linear regression model, which explains the price solely based on the longitude of the home. Doing this and taking a look at the summary, we see that the p-value is essentially zero. This provides strong evidence, very strong evidence, against the null hypothesis that beta is equal to zero. But remember, the hypothesis testing related to regression models relies on our distributional assumptions. Taking a quick look at the diagnostics, both of the standardized residuals versus the longitude and the QQ plots of the residuals, there are concerning trends. The QQ plot deviates tremendously from the expected straight line, and there are some trends in the standardized residuals. This model does not appear to be one we should be making decisions from. Remember that when we include a factor in a regression model, we are using that factor to explain some part of the expected value of our outcome. So if we include an additional factor in the model, 
we are trying to explain the simultaneous effects of all of the different factors that we have included. Sometimes you will hear people say that they are controlling for the effects of a factor. This is not quite right, but it gives an idea of what is happening. When we fit the simple linear regression between the price per unit area and longitude, we are ignoring the impact that the other factors may have in the price per unit area. Instead, what if we looked at a fairly complicated model that included all of the factors and some additional features that we have in our data? Now, in this case, we can take a look at the same diagnostics and they look a little bit better. There are some large residuals, which we would not expect to see if these were actually normal, and the upper tail on the QQ plot seems like a poor fit. Still, this appears to be much better than the simple model we had tried before. So what if we look at the results here? Does the factor for longitude matter? Let's say that we want to determine whether beta is different from zero, and we are okay with keeping around a trait which has a 15% chance of randomly occurring if it is actually zero but not higher than that. This would be equivalent to checking if the p-value is larger than or equal to 0.15 on the significance test. Alternatively, and equivalently, we could form an 85% confidence interval and see if that interval contains zero. Now, I'm doing it this way to hopefully give you all a better sense of how we can work with p-values and confidence intervals to accomplish similar goals. If you're confused about this, you should take a look at the tutorials on confidence intervals and on hypothesis testing. Let's do this. We can call confint. We pass in the fitted model object and we can pass the parm to be long as that's what I've called it in my data set. We can pass the level to be 0.85 and read the output off. Here, we see that the lower bound on the confidence interval was negative 28.3 and the upper bound was 164.2. This interval very clearly contains zero, and that means that the p-value is going to exceed 0.15. As a result, we can conclude that at a 15% level of significance, if we take into account the other factors that we've included in this model, the longitude is not predictive of house prices per unit area. If the true impact of the longitude was zero on the house prices, then in more than 15% of cases, we'd expect to view an effect as extreme as the one that we have. If I look at the model output, I can see that the stores variable has a p-value of nearly zero. As a result, we can be pretty confident that this factor is important for explaining the price of houses. This variable in the data counted the number of convenience stores that were near the house, and the estimated coefficient value was 2640. So how do we interpret this? Well, for every unit increase in the stores variable, we would expect that the price per unit will increase by 2,640, assuming that we keep everything else constant. This last bit is important. If we change the stores variable, but we also change the other factors in the model, then the 2640 value is not directly interpretable. However, if we commit to keeping every value constant, then each additional store in the vicinity increases the expected price per unit area by 2640. There's something very strange here with this coefficient. We can look at the following smooth histogram of all of the observed prices in the data set and see that the prices tend to fall somewhere between 5 and 80. However, this coefficient suggests that every store around the house increases the unit price by 2640. How can this be? Well, there are a few things at play here. First, we have an intercept of the model that's a highly negative number. This means that the first couple of stores are really only having the effect of offsetting that negative start. Now, the other factor here, and this is beginning to move beyond the scope of the course, but it's an important lesson. This model is actually fairly complex. You see, in looking at the full coefficients table, I've included numerous other factors, and some of these factors actually include the number of stores in them. In particular, I have included a term which is equal to the number of stores times by the distance to the nearest station and the number of stores times by the latitude. So remember that we had said that the 2640 represents the expected increase, assuming that we keep everything else constant. Well, how are we going to keep everything else constant when the other terms include the number of stores? Think back to our model for weight, which included both height and the squared height. What happens if we increase height by one unit? 
Well, that's going to depend on how the squared height changes. Hypothetically, if x equals negative 0.5 and we increase it by 1, then x equals 0 0.5. However, in this case, we have not changed the square of x. Things have gotten more complex. This complexity is a feature of the models. It lets us capture more complex patterns and begins to show off the real utility of these methods. Unfortunately, as the models grow to be more complex, simple interpretations are harder to come by. And we have to be very careful when we're working with them. Again, this content is largely beyond the scope of STAT 231, but I wanted to demonstrate this as a lesson in care when we are interpreting what is going on. It's important to always fall back onto what it is we are actually modeling. I'd encourage you to play around with these data a little bit for yourself. The model that includes only the factors in the data set except for longitude actually performs quite well, and that one is easier to interpret. Can you use that model to determine what the impact of a store is on the unit price? For the final example today, I wanted to look at some data from songs on Spotify and try to work out what makes a song popular. These last data that we are considering revolve around information of songs scraped from Spotify. The basic premise is that with these data, we want to try and forecast how popular a song will be, which is a numeric rating between 0 and 100, based on some features of the song. Now, these data are quite interesting to dig around with, but ultimately I want to use this to showcase that sometimes our model fit with regression will just not look right. That's okay. As indicated previously, a regression equation can still be useful even if our model diagnostics fail. The rationale is that, while it cannot be considered a maximum likelihood estimator, and therefore we cannot use the results relating to the distributions of these estimators, it still produces the least squares estimate among linear estimators. What I have done with the Spotify data is split it into two components. There are approximately 175,000 songs observed in this data, so I selected 80% of those and began to treat those as the data that I actually observe. The other 20% I'm going to keep off to the side for one moment. Using the data that I've observed, that is the 80% of it, I fit a regression model that we can look at for a moment. We'll start with the residual plots, and the first thing to note Residuals versus fitted exhibit the same banding pattern we saw before. This is a little bit less obvious here, perhaps, but this occurs simply due to us treating a discrete variable, the popularity, as though it were continuous. There are some residuals which are larger than we would like to see, which I've marked in the bluish color on this plot, and perhaps it's worth investigating this slightly. These are values exceeding a standardized residual of three, the model is correct, we would expect to see roughly 380 such points plotted, when in reality we observe almost 1200. We also see that the QQ plot exhibits some strange behavior. It's pretty clear that we have violations of normality here, and that our model assumptions are not met. At this point, we would typically have a couple of options. First, we could try out different functional forms in our regression model. Perhaps we should include some more factors or drop other ones. Alternatively, we could try some transformations of the outcome variable. This can be fruitful on occasion where the data may exhibit better properties if we consider a log or square root transform. The other option is to give up the benefits that come from making distributional assumptions. Let's say that instead of explaining the relationship with interpretable coefficients or making statements regarding our confidence, we just wanted a relationship that could predict new observations fairly well. A linear regression viewed as a least squares estimator can serve this role for us. This brings us back to the splitting of our data. If we take the model that we fit and use it to predict on the 20% of the data that we left out, how good does this work? In R, we can continue to use the predict function for this purpose, but now we will not specify an interval. Remember, our confidence intervals and prediction intervals rely on distributional results that we could not verify here. This next plot has a lot of information on it. It may be worth pausing to take a look at. What we see here are box plots of the residuals for each of the true popularity level for the data that we have seen. To form this, we take the 80% of the data that the model used, predict our outputs on them, subtract the predicted value from the true value to form the residuals, and then form box plots 
of these residuals for each of the possible popularity values. We see that for the lower values, our model tends to have negative residuals. We are predicting too high for the unpopular songs. Conversely, for the larger values, our model is under predicting. Now, it's worth noting that these data are greatly skewed towards a popularity of zero, which is the cause for at least some of this strangeness. Now, I want to replace this with an almost identical plot, this time on the data that we held back. We see that almost the same pattern emerges. What does this mean for us? Well, it means that we were able to use the model that we fit to predict the data we had not seen about as well as we could predict the data that we did see. Unfortunately, in this case, that's not a particularly strong showing. This model can certainly be improved majorly, but it does showcase a useful point. While the underlying assumptions are violated, we can still generate a broadly useful model for prediction. A few things to note. First, these predictions can be negative right now, which is something we should check more closely. For instance, we could just cut off at zero or perhaps be slightly more sophisticated about it. Second, the data set contains nearly 25% of songs with zero popularity. We could ask what would happen if we considered a filtered data set, this time ignoring any observations with a value of zero. Why might we do this? Well, it seems possible that the songs could have zero popularity for a number of reasons. Perhaps they are really unpopular, but also perhaps they have simply never been discovered. As a result, it could be the case that the standard metrics for predicting whether or not a song will be popular only work for songs that have exhibited some degree of popularity, at which point we would want to model the two processes separately. Will this song ever be heard by anyone? And if so, will it be popular? In fact, I can tell you that if you restrict the data above a particular popularity threshold, they may start to become better behaved. Choosing this threshold is more of an art than a science, but it could be very interesting to look at, say, songs with a popularity of over 10 and do similar modeling on them. I think that will result in models that better conform to our expectations. In any event, these data are also uploaded to the course website, and I'd encourage you to download them and play around. If you do, and you find anything interesting, I would love to hear about it. Certainly, let me know. And with that, I will end this week's tutorial. I hope that it was enjoyable for you all, and that seeing some applications of these methods convinces you that what you're learning is actually a fairly useful set of skills, and helps you have some more confidence in working with regression models. I'd like to stress that many of these regression models would be beyond the scope of this course to expect you to do on your own, but the ideas reinforced with them should help in the content that is covered. Moreover, I hope that seeing some practical examples may give you some confidence to work with this beyond the confines of this course. Regression modeling is a tool that is incredibly pervasive in statistics and in data science. Many machine learning models are really just regression models dressed up in fancy clothing. I think that with regression models, there are a few important ideas to keep in mind. First, remember that in order to make statements regarding the distributions, we start by assuming that our outcome is normal with a particular mean function. We should validate these assumptions by considering the model diagnostics and be very careful to seek out possible issues with that assumption. Second, once you have a model, you should work hard to investigate it. Sometimes the interpretation is easy, sometimes it's more involved. In any case, it can help to write down the model if you're in doubt and try to consider what happens as the inputs change. This works for simple models, like the ones you'll be dealing with in this course, and this also works for more complicated models. Third, it's important to understand the restrictions of your models. If your outcome is really discrete, you are going to expect some odd behavior because your model is likely not predicting discrete values. If there is a maximum or minimum value for your outcome, your regression may not respect that. It's also important to not make conclusions that are not supported by the model. Remember, and this will be stressed in the future in this course, regression models point out relationships that are present in the data. They do not indicate causality and they do not guarantee performance outside of the data set of interest. If we have interest in a value of x, which is far away from any observed values, we cannot be sure that the model will extrapolate to that point. This is all to say that regression is a very powerful tool, but it must be used with care. Over the next week, we will continue to look at regression models. 
While you do that, I'd encourage you to come back to this video and see if any of what I'm saying makes some more sense. Playing around with and exploring for yourself is one of the best ways to learn. As always, if you have any questions at all, please ask away. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you back here next week.